third principle that supports the law of attraction is the law of choice and accountability. The law of choice and accountability is that your perception of reality is a choice and not a condition, and that your experience in life is your creation, whether you realize it or not. The more accountability you take for your reality, the greater power you have to change it. Reality just is, regardless of how we perceive it or label it. According to Shakespeare, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. And until you take ownership of current reality, you can never change it and you can never progress. You are stuck. You're powerless and you're chained to your negative blame-filled perceptions. Life is hard and your job sucks and no one around you will cooperate with your idea of fairness. Arguing with reality leads to suffering. You are the creator. You are creating your life every day and every moment. Life isn't happening to you. You're responsible for your life. You are the author of your story. And you can author that story unconsciously, or you can be conscious of your thoughts and actions and navigate them with clarity. Every human being by nature is a creator, and everyone has the same access to the same amazing power. The difference is that some know how to create on purpose, while others go along unconsciously, accidentally, which leads to the mediocrity and misery. In other words, you are responsible for everything you create, consciously or unconsciously. And like I mentioned before, in spite of our ability to choose, imagine, and create, one of the critical aspects of accepting reality is to be clear on what our gifts are. Know who we are and realize our personal limitations. Um, Just like I said, I'm small in stature and a female, and on top of that, I'm 50 years old. So I'm not well suited for the NFL. It's a personal limitation. So any amount of effort in that direction is going to be a wasted effort for me. Most people's perceptions of the law of attraction is that you can do and be anything you want. You just have to stick to a vision board and imagine that it's real. Yeah. (laughs) There's more to it than that. Your true purpose is defined as much by your gifts and talents as by your limitations. And in this sense, understanding your limitations is actually liberating rather than constricting. It keeps you from wasting your time trying to be something that you weren't meant to be. We all come here with a true nature which includes limits and potentials. And we learn as much about ourselves by running into our limitations as by experiencing our potentials. If we're going to live our lives to the fullest, then we need to embrace our opposites and live in a creative tension between our limits and our potential. We must honor our limitations in ways that don't distort our nature. And we must trust and use our gifts in ways that fulfill the potential that God gave us. So the bottom line is that there is is a life as it is, not how the individual sees it or how we think it should be. It's just reality through the eyes of the divine. How God sees it. Just perfect truth. People who unconsciously drift through life have a false perception of reality, and they're unwilling to accept reality for what it is. It's just what's real. No need to find fault with it, or complain about it, or color it with negative stories to sensationalize it. It just is what it is. But if everyone is a creator, and everyone has the power to choose, then what about when other people use their power to choose in ways that hurt me. My husband's brother was hit by a drunk driver and killed when he was 16 years old. It was perceived as a tragedy that deeply affected my husband and his family. His brother was his hero, and now he was gone. Do you think that was the life that he created for himself? No. But it was his life, and it couldn't be undone. And as far as we know, my brother-in-law didn't choose to die that night. It was irrefutable reality. He's gone. We can argue against that reality and refuse to accept it, but no amount of protest, anger, or depression is going to change that reality. And if we were to wallow in anger and self-pity, 
and unforgiveness for the rest of our lives, then that anger and self-pity and unforgiveness would be our own creation. We have to focus on our own choices and actions and understanding that we don't have any control over others. We take accountability for our own choices and accept the results of those choices. Is the loss of our brother a tragedy? It certainly required some adjustment on our part, but it was, and it was anything but easy. But labeling it a tragedy is a perception and not an objective reality. If everyone did this and became conscious of what they were creating and found their true calling and way to serve others, it's actually what we call the golden rule then we wouldn't have to suffer the consequences of someone else's unconscious creation. But we still have a choice, and that choice is to take the high road and choose our reaction and emotions wisely, even in the midst of pain. There was a guy that I read about once named Viktor Frankl, and he was a man who spent three years in the concentration camps during World War II under the most unimaginable, inhumane circumstances. He was a Jewish psychiatrist, and after his experience in the Nazi camps, he published something called Man's Search for Meaning, which is one of the best books you could read. And in this book, he describes his experience, and he asks, do the prisoner's reaction to the singular world of the concentration camp prove that man cannot escape the influence of his surroundings? And we can answer these questions from experience as well as on principle. The experience of camp life show that man does have a choice of action. There were enough examples, often of heroic nature, which proved that apathy could be overcome. Irritability could be suppressed. Man can preserve the vestige of spiritual freedom, of independence of mind, even in such terrible conditions of psychic and physical stress. And he says, We who lived in the concentration camps can remember the men who walked through the huts comforting others giving away their last piece of bread. They may have been few in number, but they offer sufficient proof that everything can be taken away from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedom, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Most of our beliefs are just interpretations or subjective perceptions, and we have undeniable power to choose to interpret events and circumstances which, with empowerment rather than victimhood. Victimhood is a choice, not a condition, and it limits your ability to be in charge of your life because you are giving your power away. And if you've been wronged by another person, no matter how severe the offense, and if you hold tightly to the hurt and offense, you have then given your power over to victimhood, refusing to forgive, and seeking revenge make you a puppet to your hate and anger. It becomes your new master. Like victimhood, fear is also a choice, not an inevitable condition. This was my hardest lesson, and I was so immersed in my own fear that I couldn't accomplish anything. But the truth is, fear doesn't even exist except in our own perception. It's an illusion that we've made real. And fear does come naturally to us, but that doesn't mean that we have to become a slave to it. Failure is also a perception that leads us around by the nose ring if we let it. People will take risks without knowledge, and then they come away with the wrong lesson when it fails. What if a person partners with an unethical guy, and then this guy walks away with thousands of dollars and leaves that person deep in debt? Well, commonly most people would walk away from that with the belief or perception the partnerships are bad, and then they'd kick themselves for partnering and hate the other guy for being so dumb. And the truth is, this person made several critical mistakes along the way and would have been better off just taking responsibility for his own actions and reactions. The lesson learned would then be, next time I'll do more research so that if I do partner with someone, I know that they're trustworthy. We make decisions based on our perceptions. And if our perceptions are flawed and disempowering, how can we ever make wise decisions that lead to true success? How can we ever refine our perception if we don't look at them and analyze them consciously? There's a space between stimulus and response. 
We are not captive to automated responses. There's no need to waste time whining that our failures are not our fault. We don't want to absolve ourselves of guilt by assigning blame to someone or something outside of ourselves. Choose the high road during that space between event and reaction. Be conscious of your thoughts at that time. What are you creating? Have you ever noticed that the word create and react are made up of the exact same letters? Pretty cool. (laughs) The choice between those two options creates your destiny. Sometimes a horrible misfortune is actually a brilliant opportunity to propel yourself forward to a future of greatness. Napoleon Hill wrote that every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. So again, when something happens, you have a choice to focus on the immediate failure and wallow in grief and self-pity, or you can focus on the seed of the long-term benefit. You can use the law of attraction to see the positive in difficult events and attract greater positivity, or you can let the negative drag you down even further. The power of choice is yours. If you are the one that chooses how you will perceive this event and how you choose to respond, then why not choose an inspiring, worthy path? There's really nothing to lose except excuses or complaints. You were born for more than that. It doesn't usually happen overnight. It is a process. Your subconscious is very powerful. So is your conscious mind, but it takes vigilant consistency to train it. The false and limiting beliefs in your unconscious will constantly try to hijack your progress with, I'm not good enough, or I'm not worthy, or I'm not smart enough. Whatever it is, As long as you're consciously aware aware of that and committed to overcoming it, then you will prevail. The truth is, your beliefs determine your behavior. So it's imperative to be conscious of your self-talk and shift to the positive and then pinpoint your unconscious beliefs that drive many of your choices and decisions. I want to take some time now to go through a belief-breaking exercise that you can use to consciously change your beliefs. I will give you the other three laws that support the law of attraction. The law of attraction. Our unconscious beliefs or our core belief systems consist of programs and beliefs with emotions mixed into the mesh. These beliefs, programs, and perceptions occur in a hierarchy from the subconscious level to a more obvious conscious level or behavior. If you look at a tree, then the leaves and the branches are the most notable parts of the tree. In our belief systems, you could say that the branches and leaves are like the obvious symptoms that we have in our body or the fruit we're receiving in our lives from the beliefs that are planted there or the behaviors that we're expressing that come from those roots. You can't really get rid of a tree by just cutting it down. And it might work to consciously change behaviors, but then you get those little suckers coming up saying, I'm not good, or I'm not worthy, or I might do something wrong, and pretty soon you have a tree again. So what we want to do is get to the root and get those roots up and plant a good tree or positive beliefs that will bear good fruit. An example might be on the conscious level, um, might say, I can't lose weight. Consciously, you'd say, well, I choose to weigh 150 pounds, and then you go on a diet and you start exercising. So all of that is conscious. But underneath underneath that, let's say there is an unconscious core belief of, if I lose weight and look great, I'll have an affair. Because attractive women are unfaithful. Okay, so that is where testing becomes invaluable. This uh, lady in this example, this belief, if I lose weight and look great, I'll have an affair, it's a true story. When this lady was young, her mother had an affair and it ruined her mother's marriage. And it put put this little girl's life, it happened when she was a little girl, but it put this little girl's life into a turmoil that became very emotionally traumatic, and she felt like nothing in her life was stable. And so when she hit puberty, she put on a lot of weight, and it, it wouldn't come off no matter what she did. Her unconscious was terrified of that type of instability in her life. And so her automatic behavior kept her from slimming down until we found and cleared that faulty belief. 
we pulled it up from the root and we replaced that faulty belief with, I am releasing weight and I am still faithful. Attractive women do have successful marriages. Are your beliefs about health or abundance aligned with the truth or are they aligned with lies? Negative emotions are the first clue that something is out of alignment. Negative emotions tell us that there is a faulty belief in our root system somewhere. There is a reason that we stay in that negative place and there's something that we want to dig up and throw out. So let's take a moment to think. What negative things set you off? What emotions come up with that? What is the self-talk that goes on with that? Underneath the surface, what are you telling yourself about that? And then write that down on your notes page. What is it that sets us off? What emotions come up with that? And what is the self-talk that goes on with that? What are we telling ourselves? Just take a minute and write that down, if you can think of anything right here in the moment. The belief may be close enough to the surface to reach without testing. Think about it for a minute. What belief is it that holds all of this here for you right now? What belief is keeping you in that negative place that spews these negative emotions and comments, the negative self-talk that always seems to bubble up from that place? Can you think of any? If you identify any without testing, you can go ahead and write, look deep inside at what's going on in your life. What is it that you believe about yourself that is giving you the results that you don't want? Our body is the next clue that something's out of alignment. When we are in a place of illness and pain, then there's something blocking the divine light in us. Or even if we're in a place of lack of abundance and we're struggling to make ends meet. There was a young man that was in his mid-20s and he had, he'd been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder. And he was on medication. He was a, he was a smart kid. You know, he was a smart young man. But he was really angry. They were going to do surgery of some sort on his brain and try to alleviate the symptoms. And he needed a number of sessions spread out over a period of time. And what came up in his healing process with muscle testing was that he had several traumatic experiences at school when he was younger where he had been teased and taunted and put down by other school children and sometimes even by the teachers. And he had a lot of sadness going on. And he was really insecure and angry. The beliefs that were found were, I'm different. I must not be human. I'm not wanted. I act out what you perceive me to be. I am angry at everything and everybody, and I use my anger to hide the hurt. And his hurt ran really deep. These experiences caused him to feel obsessed with controlling his world, and he used his anger to gain what he felt like was power in his world, and he destroyed things to prove his power. And this is an extreme example of how faulty beliefs affect us. Needless to say, this young man is much happier and normal now, and surgery was avoided. I've seen 20-year incurable skin problems clear up in less than two weeks just by clearing a faulty belief that was not serving that person well. This person had a powerful intention. He'd been fired by his boss 20 years previous, and he, he was very angry. The unconscious intention was for his boss to see how angry and hurt he was. The underlying belief in his root system was, if my boss sees how hurt I am, he'll give me my job back. And when we brought all this conscious and he realized that this belief was not serving him, the skin issue went away just like that. And then the final clue that something is out of alignment is victimhood. We don't always realize that we are in victimhood, but excuses as to why we can't do something is us telling ourselves that we are a victim, blaming someone else for something or some circumstance is victimhood. Our number one goal tonight is to consciously step out of victimhood and to start to identify the limiting beliefs that keep us there. And I want everyone to stop and ask themselves right now like we did before. What is the number one belief that is keeping me from greatness? Let's just think about that for a minute. What is the number one belief? I don't deserve it. I'm not worth it. I'm not good enough. You can be blinded by the moments of darkness and negative self-talk that we sometimes fall into. And in those moments, it's time to turn to your gratitude garden. And we're going to talk about that gratitude garden and getting into the 
feeling place of success. But let's say, for right now, let's say that the belief is I'm not good enough. And then you might replace that with, I am worthy of all that I am blessed with and will be blessed with. I am good. And then we could look under that belief. What happened that created the belief? You don't always have to go to the insertion point of the belief, but sometimes it helps to see the truth if you do. So let's say that you made a mistake that made you feel like you were unworthy. And everyone makes mistakes. And all mistakes do have consequences. They do. But the mistake doesn't make us bad. The consequences don't make us bad. If we had come into this world perfect, then there wouldn't be any point in coming here at all because our whole life is a training ground for becoming. We do learn a lot. And we certainly don't do the mistake again after we learned. But what is the truth? The mistake didn't make us bad. In other words, we tripped. The consequences were that we fell and we learned and we got back up and we moved on a smarter person. But we still deserve the good things in our lives. One of the main things that we find in people with faulty belief systems here at Quantum Techniques is that if we make a mistake, that we have to be punished. And as adults, something happens that wasn't quite right, and so we start looking around to be hit by lightning. And when we realize God isn't going to punish us, and our parents aren't there to punish us, we automatically punish ourselves, so we feel vindicated of our mistake. Right now, we'll talk a little bit about the blocks to abundance chart. And then I'm going to take you through a quick exercise to help clear belief. If you've not learned to self-test yet, you can also turn your thoughts inward and meditate on that a little and ask yourself, what is the number one blocking belief that is keeping me from greatness? What comes to mind that is limiting your greatness, your abundance? A lot of times you can find your limiting belief by looking at your story. What do you complain about? What is the limiting belief behind that story? When you have your limiting belief in mind, I want you to relax for a moment and close your eyes and follow me in this exercise. You got a limiting belief in mind? Okay. So now thinking of this limiting belief, ask yourself, what is the first memory that comes to mind when I think that thought? What age was I? Do you remember? Has this become a pattern for me? What emotions are involved with that memory? And if you need to, you can test those emotions out if you know how to muscle test. How has this belief served me? How has it affected my result? How is it affecting me today? What is the cost of believing this thought? Has it impacted my finances, my health, my relationship, my personal power? How often does this belief trigger a negative pattern? How long does it take to come out of this negative pattern? How much time is lost? Okay. So let's bring someone else into the picture now even if they aren't part of the memory. Who do you implicitly trust? Someone you completely trust to be your advocate. It could be a childhood friend or a grandfather or a current day friend or a spouse or even a deity. Have you got someone in mind? At the very point when you were taking on this belief, what would they say to you? What words of advice or wisdom would they give you? How would they encourage you? What do you need to hear? If there's a lot of emotion involved, you can also use Ho'oponopono or run your finger over the trauma code to help release the emotion. And we'll talk about the power of forgiveness in one of the next two teleclinics in this series. No matter what your circumstances are at the moment, you always have a choice. What is the truth? What belief would serve me better? Think of something that contains only positive words and try that new unlimited belief out. How does it feel? I am good. I am worthy. I am loved and I deserve it. Let's say that new belief out loud with conviction. It's okay to say no. I am forgiven. This is now your new root belief. What do you think the result of this new root belief will be? Now, in order to create a new neural pathway in the brain with this new belief that we have found, we're going to commit to do the work to own this new belief, override the old belief, 
and allow this new belief to begin serving you. This gives you evidence that the new belief is true and seats it strongly into the unconscious. You can begin creating this evidence as you choose with faith to believe this new thought. Are you willing to dedicate the time and emotion and energy to reciting this belief with power every day? Are you willing to commit to do the work of this new belief? What can I do today to immediately begin putting this new belief into action? And when you do those things, then the old root or the old belief will wither and die out. Okay, now open your eyes. How do you feel? Breathe in deeply and exhale a deep and cleansing breath. Wow, you did great. Okay, and so we learned a lot tonight. It feels good to change those beliefs. It changes everything. I hope that everyone has gained some insight tonight to see how powerful you really are and what a force for good in this world you are. So I hope to see you all here again next week. I hope everybody has a wonderful evening. And thanks for tuning in tonight. I'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.